So this over here is a fancy motherboard for gamers and for creators. And if you're a creator, you probably like the fact that this has three M.2 Gen 5 slots on this motherboard. That's a little bit of a marketing, uh, oh, you can get this much, but actually we're gonna take some other features away if you do that. So we're gonna chew through all of the weird things about this motherboard, show you the good sides, bad sides, and everything you need to know if you're thinking about picking up this motherboard for $450. Why is it so expensive? Well, you're gonna find out right after this. Licensing Windows is cheap and easy with whokeys.com and if you use the code TN20 you get an extra discount. Complete the purchase, copy the key, and paste it to the activation settings. And you're all done! Also check out their Microsoft Office 19 license and use the same code TN20 for the extra discount. Check out hookies.com in the video description below. So this is the Asus ROG Strix X670E e gaming Wi-Fi motherboard okay what is that m.2 heatsink mass massive bundle okay well that's new oh my wow gee, wow so you get an extra heatsink if you want extra metal to take to the okay and then a wi-fi antenna then we've got the motherboard. Now, because it's ROG Strix, you're probably gonna get a lot of different accessories. So ROG keyring, stickers, user manual. Well, oh, not as much as I thought. A GPU sag bracket type of thing that goes on the bottom of the PC case. Zip ties, two SATA cables, these square little stickers for the one-sided M.2s. I'll show you where these go later. Little rubber foot leg. I'm not sure what that is for. Extra easy latch for the M.2. And another one of those. And a spare thermal pad. Now then, you can see the design of this is very gamerly. You know, what you can see from ROG. A lot of different shapes, tricks, lots of Republic of Gamers written everywhere. For those who dare and blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm not particularly a fan of that type of design, but, you know, for some people, you know, whatever. There is a little bit of uh, something in here that will illuminate when you turn the motherboard on, but I'm not sure if there's any other RGB on the motherboard. You can see very beefy heat sinks for all of the VRMs and power delivery. I think this is 18 plus two power stages, so plenty for your CPUs and for overclocking if you want to do that. We've got our AM5 CPU socket here that supports Ryzen 7000, 8000, 9000, and probably some even after that. So a lot of CPU support, different generations, worth uh, picking that one up, even if like the new CPUs come out, is definitely a solid motherboard. We can see a quick latch for the GPU PCIe removal or the lock on doing that. That's just pressing down and this pulls that out, very helpful as well. But let's talk through the different headers on the motherboard and what it offers. So on the top there, we have two EPS CPU power headers, and there is also like a little red light underneath. So if you haven't plugged your power plug in, it will light up. So the left one, you're gonna plug in first, and then the right one is like an optional one if you wanna plug in that as well, but it should work with just the left one. I recommend plugging in both of them, but in theory, even one of them could support 300 plus something watts power delivery, so you should be completely fine. Then moving here, we've got some fan headers and AIO headers. So we've got CPU fan and CPU fan optional header. So these two share the fan curve. So whatever you plug into one or the other or whatever you set the CPU fan, it will be also for the CPU optional. That is like that on all of the Asus motherboards or at least most of them, what I know. AIO pump header is running 100% at all the time and you're not going to be able to change that and there's a few more other fan headers what i can see here that's number four five six seven and eight all of them support up to 12 watts which is interesting usually it's 24 watts but for some reason all of these are 12 watts Moving on here, we have the Dr. Debug or Q code and then the boot post sequence lights underneath red for CPU, amber for RAM, white for VGA, and green for post. Then we've got two RGB headers, one 12 volt RGB header, one five volt in here. Start button, which is nice. So if you wanna do overclocking, you don't wanna put it in the case, you can just start the PC with this button over there. 24 pin ATX power header. I wish they'd change these power plugs now. So this would be, for example, the one 12 volt high power cable that provides up to 600 watts. Maybe we can plug it one in there and we don't need this anymore. 
that will be it. That will be really nice because less cables, less clutter. We've got front panel USB type C header, which is actually gen two X two slot, which means 20 gigabits in speed front panel USB type A, which is five gigabits in speed. It's got a nice metal on around both of them for strength of the plugs. We've got four SATA ports angled to the side here. Then we've got CPU over voltage header with this jumper pins. There's three pins here and right now the first and the second are jumped and then the third one on the right is free. Now for most people, you don't need to worry about this. You just leave it there and that's going to be fine. It's only when you want to do some serious overclocking, you put it to the other side and then you can add even more voltage to the CPU. But honestly, 99% people I'm just going to leave it in there. Then we've got uh, an alternator switch. So basically this is the PCA generation switch for this slot in there. If it's on auto, this is basically gen five or auto. But if you put gen four card in there, it's still you know, gen switches to gen four. If you put it one down in the middle, it's going to be gen four. And then all the way there, it's going to be gen three. Why this is necessary, I don't know. I guess when you do an overclocking, you want to force this to be a certain, you know, generation and you can't access BIOS, I guess that's helpful. Then we've got our front panel system headers in there. There, there are two pins here that says MR test two, and I have no idea what that's gonna do. Uh, I guess it's some kind of test for something. I mean, Captain Obvious, thanks very much for that, but it's nowhere in the manual or anywhere mentioned, so. I don't know. You either get two extra pins for free because it's not mentioned. I don't know. Moving on here after chassis. This is not mentioned on the manual. Uh, on the manual, you look, this doesn't even exist um, on either of the things. So I think this is the TPM module, but because that's what it looks like. I guess Asus, it's time to update your manual. What some of these pins actually do, because some people like me actually read through all the manual to make these videos. So it will be helpful if they showed this. Let me show you in here. Yeah, look at this. This is the place where the pin should be. Here, there's nothing there. They just show three USB 2.0 headers, which we have in there, but there's nothing there. Again, another motherboard layout. No pins in there are there. So after chassis fans, we have a Thunderbolt 4 header. So Asus does the Thunderbolt card, which most likely you're gonna put on this slot there. And then you can get Thunderbolt on AMD motherboards, which is really, really nice as well. I guess graters, that would be good. I would be definitely interested in this. And then we've got two more five volt ARGB headers, and then finally front panel header in there. And there's another header just next to the CPU socket there that is not mentioned anywhere either. I don't know what it is. Most likely this is not for most people. So we've got four DDR5 slots here that officially supports up to 64 mega transfers per second or megahertz speeds. I think you're going to get faster speeds when you update the BIOS. They've just been a bit conservative because this is not like the newest version, but you should be able to get much faster speeds on these as well, especially when running do dim sticks. Four of them, it's a little bit tricky. AM5, IMC is not as good as Intel's. So when you want to be a creator and run 128 gigabytes plus, you're not going to be getting very good speed so you might need to run them at 4800 5000 something like that speed some people get it faster if you're running am5 platform let me know what speed ram you're running when you have 128 gigabytes or more so let's undo these heat sinks here to see what's underneath okay so this is the top slot as you can see we've got a heat pipe and a little bit of space underneath to make the top slot cool. We've got thermal pad on the top and cooling underneath as well. Then we've got a big slab in the middle here for cooling the chipset. And because this is X670E, it is kind of like a dual chipset. So there's two chips in there for the chipset. Let's see if we can see them. No, not necessarily. Here we have heatsink only on the top, nothing underneath, little heatsink there. And then a big slab heatsink underneath or we can see here, as you can see. And the cooling is only on the top sides and nothing underneath. Now the extra heatsink that we got in the box, as you can see, that is quite a bit thicker and heavier. So you can put that underneath there, but bear in mind, you will have to have a GPU that's not too thick because if your GPU is too thick, you might actually hit that. So bear that in mind, but it is a much bigger, like probably two 
and a half or three times better cooling capacity than the one that was included on the motherboard. Now let's talk about these PCIe expansion slots and the M.2 slots and the switching that's going on. Now Asus is not very clear on their manual exactly how the switching works. It's a bit confusing because there's no actual block diagram but here's what we do know. This is PCIe Gen 5 16 slot. This is PCIe Gen 5 4 slot. So the pins go only to there. So there's 4 lanes to there. And this one is PCIe Gen 4 X4 slot. Now this PCIe Gen 4 X4 is not going to the CPU and that goes to the chipset. And if you want to have the Thunderbolt header and that you know that can go into there so that's a little bit separate these two usually you see x8 and x8 but this one is not actually that when you put anything in here the top slot will start to run at x8 this one will start to run at x4 and then this m.2 here will start to run at x4 as well whenever you plug something in to this m.2 or this one here then suddenly everything starts to switch down because these three share the bandwidth here okay so this top slot is pcie gen 5 x5 goes to the cpu that doesn't change anything and then this fourth slot here is pcie gen 4 x4 slot goes to the chips chipset and doesn't share any bandwidth so these two are sorted so these two go directly to the cpu so we've got 24 lanes to play with and then plus four goes to the chipset to communicate with this. So the four to the chipset goes directly into there. I hope this makes sense. So these two directly to the CPU, PCI Gen 5, four slots. Now, if you plug anything into here or into here, we start losing this, this and that. So only these three here share the bandwidth. So yes, in theory, you can have three PCI Gen 5 M.2 SSDs at full speed, but then your GPU is going to start to run PCIe Gen 5 X8, and because there's no PCIe Gen 5 X8 GPUs, only PCIe Gen 4 X16 CP GPUs, that means that your GPU is going to run PCIe Gen 4 X8 speed, which is the same as PCIe Gen 3 X16, which in theory you shouldn't really notice the bit difference, but in some instances you might. So it's a little bit iffy. What I'd like to see is also heat sinks underneath here as well, because these are PCI Gen 5 and they can run quite hot. So I'd like to see underneath there as well. Now, remember these rubber square stickers that were in the box? These are for these little rubber standoff towers here. And if your M.2 is only one sided, so it's got chips only on the top, what you want to do is put this little sticker underneath there because then it will support it when you screw the heatsink down it's not going to bend the m.2 too much because it supports that but if your m.2 is double-sided you're just going to leave it in there and then the double-sided will just rest on there and it's not going to be bent down when you're screwing this down let me know if that made sense to you let's check out the io because there is plenty of stuff going on in here so we've got hdmi and display port out so that's the igpu in there We've got 12 10 gigabit USB ports. Now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 are USB type A, and they're all 10 gigabits in speed, as you can see the red ports in here. Then we've got one USB type C in here, that's 10 gigabits in speed. So that takes us to 11. Now, this one is not marked in here, but I think that is 10 gigabits as well. So you've got plenty of USB type C connectivity there because the manual says it's 12. So now, we would have 12 all together. Then we've got one more USB Type-C that's 20 gigabits in speed. So that's USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2 slot, 2.5 gigabit LAN, clear CMOS button, as well as BIOS flashback, which goes through that USB port there. So you can update your BIOS through USB, even if you don't have supported CPU or RAM or whatever. Wi-Fi 6E antennas and Bluetooth 5.2. We've got optical audio out and then other audio connectors there. Now, one thing I do have to say is I think motherboards over $300 and $350 should all have 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, Y2.5, we should have 10 on all of them. I think that is a must. And the backside of the motherboard, there is no covers in here, no protection, just bare bones with a little bit of a ROG Strix donut 
So then, is this motherboard worth getting? What do I think about it? I think it offers a lot of features. Now, what would be really helpful is if Asus sorted out its manuals and would actually know a little bit more clearer which one of these sockets goes to the CPU, which comes from the chipset, and which share bandwidth and all that sort of jazz. But what I like about it is that we've got a Thunderbolt header, which means that having Thunderbolt on this motherboard is really, really nice. And Thunderbolt can be connected to 10 gigabit Ethernet, for example, or have a dock or whatever. So that's really nice. And a lot of potential M.2 storage options there, PCI Gen 5, so super fast storage you can get in there. Can you run two GPUs in here? Well, the answer is really no, because the secondary slot is only X4, which means that it's only gonna run like PCIe Gen 4, X4, really, on the graphics cards that are out there right now. So it's only meant for one GPU. Other than that, it does have a solid design and solid build quality, what I've felt so far. The only thing worth mentioning is the Asus motherboard issues and Asus, you know, customer service that's going on around the world right now. Now, I do think they're going to fix fix it and really going to put some attention to it because they're really under a microscope. And I've had a chat with Asus already and I'm waiting to hear back what they're going to say about my situation. Stick around. We'll see what they're going to say or if if it's out already you've seen b-roll over this now if you want to pick this up i'm going to leave it in the description below and some build guys if you want to build yourself the best bank for what create a pc it's down there now if you had 450 dollars for a high-end amd5 motherboard would you go with this one or something else i'd love to know what you would buy in the comment section below thanks guys for watching and i'll see you next time Bye bye